。オーマゲナティムランダシャーガナガナサラケアチャクソルンミリタミヤナダシマイヒシギルヴィルマハ。シーチェタネマノビスタムスタピタミヤナブタレサヨムルパーカラメアンタラティスワープランディカム。バンデハムシギルシアタパラカムナムシギルンバイシナバムスチャ。シーロパムサガダタムサハガナラガナタムビタムスタムサディバム。サッバイタム、サブルータム、パリージャナ、サイタム、クリシナ、チェータニア、デヴァム、シーラーダー、クリシナ、パナン、サハガナ、ラリタシ、ビシャカン、ビタム、スチャン、ヘイ、クリシナ、カルーナ、シンドゥ、ディナ、バンド、ジガン、パテゴ、ピシャガ、ビカ、カンタ、ラダ、カンタ、ナモス、ドゥ、テン、ジャイアタム、ソルト、パンゴ、マム、ネア、マテル、ギティ、マツァ、ヴィシャパラン、ボジョ、ラダ、ナマダ、ナモノ、シーマン、ラザ、ラザ、ランビ、バムシ、パダ、カーソン、パネル、シンドゥ、グリ、コペナ、タス、リエス、ナム、シーマンランダガシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーマンシーオーマハデビチビミヒ、ビシュパニチディミヒ、タノラクミ、プチョリアテヘン、アナルトパシュマムシャクシャン、パクティオガムロケセジャー、チャクリシャクパレサミタム、サバイパムサンパロデモ、ヤトバクティラホクシティ、アイティキュプティアテ、ヤダマスープシディティ、オーマゲナティムランダシャンガナンガナ、サラケチャクソルンミリタム、ヤナタシマイ、シギルベルマ、シーチェタネマノビスタム、スタピタミアのボトレ、シャイオムロパカラメアンダラティスワープランディオン、シークリシナチェタニアパラブニチャンダ、シェアベティカラダー、シバサディゴー、バクトウィン、ハレクリシナ、ハレクリシナ、クリシナ、クリシナ、ハリハリ、ハリラム、ハリラム、ラム、ラム、ハリハリ。Wisdom Wednesday, the third in our series of three shows. In fact, we are on part three of verse 24, chapter 6, first canto of the Shimon Bhagavatam. A word from Rob, before we start, Penny, for your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhuji.、Um, just,、uh, I've had a reoccurring theme where faith cannot exist with fear,、um, that faith abolishes fear,、um, much like Narada Muni when his、uh, mother was killed. He had so much faith, there was no fear that he was going to be on his own because he knew that、uh, Krishna would care for him. The faith zone is the safe zone. <laughs> That's a good way to start. That's our launching pad for this morning. <clears throat> there can be no fear where there's faith. Thank you. Go v i n d a Dave. Haribo. Sundari Priya said she'd give the talk on Saturday. But thanks for offering. Thanks for stepping forward. Natasha. Natasha has launched a TikTok presence. We're really excited about that. I'll have to reach out to you separately and get the username and password, or at least the URL, so I can see all the good things that you're doing to promote Krishna through TikTok. Brent, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pasnaya Bhutare Srimadi Bhakti Padanta Shami Tanone. Respects, pranams to all of our listeners. Jean, <clears throat> Bhai Bhavi, Sundari Priya, thank you very much for agreeing to give the talk. We had it originally parceled out to Prashant, but he won't be back from India until February. So nice to know that this Saturday will be covered. Not sure who's going to cook, but Govinda Bhakt is back, so perhaps he'll do that. Here is our verse for the third time. Matir me, Nipadiam, Navipadiragadi, Prajasargadish, and Shmitir, Chamad, and Ugraha. Spoken directly from the lotus mouth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, to the five year old devotee, Narada Muni. Translation Intelligence engaged in my devotional service cannot be thwarted any time, even in the time of creation as well as the time of annihilation. Your remembrance will be continued by my mercy. It's fashionable nowadays to want to remember your past life through hypnotic regression.、Um, and sometimes there's a measure of success. You get a little glimmer, a little glimpse of. Maybe some impressions from a past life, some sense of deja vu, or something has unearthed, <clears throat> something has stirred up during the course of your, your dreams. But it's very partial, it can be misleading. How many millions of people were Cleopatra or Napoleon in their last lives? 
Caesar. <laughs> and I don't think anybody remembers being a dog or a cat, a cocker spaniel, or an alligator in their last life. So usually those remembrances are a little bit skewed by uh, self-ego and self-flattery. In any case, if you really want to remember your past life, then you have to become a pure devotee of the Lord. You have to get up on Bhuta Bhava. You have to get up on the spiritual platform. Let's just look at the example of Narada Muni here. In his previous life, he, as was described, he had been a very beautiful demigod and an extremely talented singer. So one time, there was, <coughs> excuse me, I still have <coughs> a lingering <coughs> COVID cough. One time there was a gathering to do kirtan. Now kirtan is directly for the glorification of the Supreme Lord. No other person, lesser person, is meant to be honored during kirtan. And yet Narada Muni went off in his own bent and he was singing what the modern day equivalent of guzzles, sort of mundane songs at this kirtan festival. And then he got cursed to take birth as a son of a maidservant lose his mother at the age of five. And that birth, that curse, as is often the case, was the greatest blessing on him. It, it divested him of his beauty, it divested him of his heavenly status, and divested him of his uh, inflated standard of living and took him down to nothing. He didn't even have a father, didn't know who his father was, lost his mother at the age of five, and was totally left on his own resources to wander the earth after the expiration of the four months of the rainy season. And yet, <clears throat> he meets the Lord. Within a very short time, he sees the Lord from within the heart. The Lord speaks to him. Devotees take great pleasure. Their hackles rise. They get goosebumps all over their body by virtue of seeing that Lord who is standing on the lotus of their heart and not just seeing him like a holograph or something, but talking to him. The Lord is telling this little boy, lost and alone in the jungle in some lonely place, the Lord is telling this little boy that devotional service, intelligence engaged in my devotional service is never thwarted at any time. That once you achieve your pure, purified spiritual body, then you will remember all of your past lives without any exception. And indeed, that's what happened at the end of that current annihilation. <clears throat> it says, Matir shmitir chamad nugraha. It says, just like lightning and illumination occur simultaneously. There may be a time lag between the sound of the lightning and the time it reaches your ears. Sound travels 1,100 feet a second. But the flash comes immediately without any lapse at all. So without any lapse, not only when he left his body, he ascended like fire will ascend from a big log in his purified spiritual body. At that time, he knew everything about all of his past lives. <clears throat> he knew the nature of the material world. He knew the nature of the spiritual world. So everything in one finger click and one fell swoop and one lightning flash, so to speak, became totally clear and totally illuminated to Krishna. And that's devotional service. When the individual living being, the part and parcel, Krishna claims all living beings as this individual, sentient, eternal parts and parcels. And all we have to do is wake up to who we really are and then everything becomes revealed just as everything is revealed at the noon day sun. During the noon day sun, there are no shadows. Everything is crystal clear. Sanskrit word is prakash. Vasudeva bhagati bhakti yoga janayat yashuna gyanamsha. Flashes of illumination, insights, creativity, <clears throat> discoveries, which are uh, squeezed out of other processes over great extended periods of time and with much difficulty and trouble automatically come showering upon the devotee as quickly and as effortlessly as the illumination from a lightning flash. No separate endeavor is required. The Lord is giving that 
assurance to Narada Muni that when you leave this body and you get your purified spiritual body from one moment to another, you go from the lower nature to the higher nature. You go from matter to spirit. And it is this touch of the spirit, it is this grace coming down from the Lord through the chain of the accession, just like um, uh, with Narada Muni, just like with Maharaj Parika, just like with Sukadeva Goswami, just like Vyasadeva, the disciple of Narada Muni, the Lord's lightning-like mercy, which uh, surcharges the recipient, the recipient of the transcendental mercy of the Lord through the descending chain of civil accession is so surcharged by the power of light and love and illumination devotional service that their lives are never ever the same again. They've had the higher taste. 59th verse, second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Bish aya bini varitante narahara shadehinam raso varjam rashopi asha param vishva navartate Vishaya, the dull, dead, temporary things of this material world, are easily given up. They easily fall by the wayside. Rasho Varjam, as soon as one gets a taste for the devotional service of the Lord. This rasa has special meaning in Sanskrit. It's almost intranslatable in English. But imagine eating a ripe, perfectly ripe, sun-matured mango. Just imagine eating it. You can be messy, have fun with it, get the pulp all over your lips and your cheeks and taste the juice and just luxuriate in the taste of a mango. That gives you some idea, some rough, crude example of what we mean by rasa. And there are five categories of rasa that the liberated soul has with the Lord. Neutrality, sanchya, dasha, servitorship, sakya, friendship, vatsalya, parental, and madhurya, conjugal love. <clears throat> Once you begin to awaken, what it is is your individual transcendental rasa amongst these five different categories. You have no longer any taste for the dull, dead things of this material world. The awakening, the taste of rasa is so powerful, so life-changing, so all-consuming that one has to make no longer any further effort to distance oneself from material names, forms, and varieties. One loses one's attraction for them altogether, having experienced what we call param drishva nivartite. Exact translation is, the embodied soul may be restricted, Bishaya from sense enjoyment. In other words, a sick man, the doctor may tell him you can't eat this and this and this. And he may observe that, but it's with great trouble. He's, he's not eating those things because he knows he shouldn't, but he wants to eat them. He hankers after them. He daydreams after them. And then the problem is that once he becomes cured, he's going to go right back to eating them as quickly as he can. That's why it said, just as a pot that has once held liquor can never be purified no matter how many times you wash it. That pot which has once held liquor can never be uncontaminated again. It will be forever tainted. So similarly, those who um, have, have tasted material sense gratification and gotten themselves entangled and full of miserably complex situations because of it, may give it up by force for some period of time, like the patient gives up his favorite foods in the interest of being cured. But then as soon as he's cured, as soon as he gets the full strength of his senses back, he thinks, well, what, what do I have my senses for? What are the uses of the senses if not to eat those same foods that caused my disease in the first place? So there's this accepting and rejecting Boga tyaga, boga tyaga, boga tyaga. You want to enjoy the enjoyment, it makes you sick. You have to 
forcibly give up your connection with the foods that made you sick for some time, but then as soon as you recover, you go right back to that. And this is material life. Boga Tyage, enjoying, and getting sick, rejecting, feeling good, then going back to enjoying, overindulging, getting sick. And that's why it says, Bhuta Boga Parichaga. Once you give up these dual poles of enjoyment and renunciation, Bhuta Boga Parichaga Neshorasham, Shwamihimi Sitashisha, the living being no longer bounce back and forth like at Wimbledon between these two extremes who has experienced the param, the higher nature of spirituality stands shra mahimi stitashista stitasha means unmoved unmoved we may go, we may vacillate, we may bounce back and forth between bog and chag, but once you experience param drishtra, the taste of spirit, which is ever satisfying, which is ever increasing, the pleasure which is oceanic, then you never again relapse into bog tyaga, but shrami himi stitashya you're firmly fixed in transcendence. And that's why it says that ceasing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste he is fixed in consciousness. Matir, what is it? Matir my Matir na Krishna parato shatova mito bibajat adanta gobri visham puna punas chavitachana. All of material life is summed up. In this verse by Prahlad Maharaj, Matir na Krishna parito shatoho mito vipadyara guriya brataram. It revolves, as we spoke last week, around sex. It starts with the attraction for a man, for a woman, and a woman for a man. Um, and then, as a result of that, one engages in sex life, in eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Just the same four areas of activities that the animals engage in. Now, one can eat, sleep, mate, and defend it as a demigod. One can eat, sleep, mate, and defend as an armadillo, as a muskrat, as a wolverine, as a, as a centipede. But the same four activities are there from the highest level of living, that of the demigods, from the highest planet, that of Lord Brahma, to the lowest planet, from the highest species, to the lowest species. It's the same thing eating, sleeping, mating, defending. You can drink out of a gold cup or you can drink out of an iron cup, but the taste of the liquid is the same. You can have sex as a demigod or you can have sex as a hog in the mud yard, but the same feeling, the same sensation is there. And it is, it is uh, <clears throat> temporary. Chanchanam himana krishna pramatabharavadija. So what the summarization of material life is eating, sleeping, mating, defending, mating, defending, eating, sleeping, sleeping, mating, defending, eating, sleeping, mating, defending. Mix up those four activities in any different permutation or combination you want and it still boils down to the same old, same old, same old, same old. Chewing the chew. Going after chasing one's tail. And in fact, anyone who seriously desires to be happy by indulging their propensities for eating, sleeping, mating, defending. In our modern society, we don't sleep on the ground, we sleep in water beds. We don't mate in the public arena, in, in, but we mate in, in privacy with all kinds of kinky toils and all. And we don't just eat whatever we can bring down or whatever we can pick from a tree, but we go to the bourbon and beefsteak restaurant, restaurant and we eat in style and we don't just defend with tooth and claw but we defend with atomic weapons and nerve gas and all kinds of bile weapons <clears throat> but it's still the same eating sleeping mating and defending over and over and over and over and over going repeatedly at some point the eternal spirit soul part and parcel of the lord inquires atato brahma jignasha how can i get out of this what is the purpose of human life? Who am I? Where do I come from? And the answer is, 
Aparayami Tashtu and Yambinu Prakritima Jiva Bhuta Mahambaru Yun. There are the Lord's inferior energies made of earth, air, fire, water, mind, intelligence, and false ego. Five of them are gross matter, three of them are subtle matter. And then Aparayami Tashtu and Yam, Apara. We're talking about Para, that which is superior, that which is eternal, that which is imperishable, that which is in itself full of juice and life and, and dy dynamism. Param, above these eightfold material elements is the jiva, the jiva soul. That is you and I. We are emanations from, we are part and parcels of the Supreme Personality of God and we're created originally to taste ras, to taste eternal, unlimited happiness in connection with the Lord, either in a neutral, a servitorship, a friendship, a parental, or a role of conjugal lover. So by the grace of the spiritual master, one becomes reacquainted with ras, with param. And when one gets that param drishva, the taste for the ras, then one never relapses back into this material uh, chewing the chewed arena. And one thing about Prabhupada was that when he spoke about the spiritual world, he spoke about it as confidently and as comfortably as you and I would speak about going down to the corner grocery store. We've done it hundreds of times. We could do it with our eyes closed. We could describe everything we see on the way. We could describe what's on the shelves. We could describe the person behind the counter. We know the prices. Prabhupada had that much familiarity with the spiritual world that as he spoke, as the words flowed from his mouth, the entire panoramic spiritual world opened up before us. Not a difficult concept. The difference between the material world and the spiritual world is that in the spiritual world, there is no matter. In the spiritual world, matter is conspicuous by its absence. anya. Besides this material world, which is temporary and changeable and illusory, there is anya, parajtajma tu bhavo anya. There is another world, vyakta vyakta. This world is coming and going, vyakta vyakta. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Vyakta vyakta. This other world is beyond the coming and going of this material world. Parajtajma tu vyakta vyakta. Yasa sarvashu buddhishu nasyachuna. It remains as it is throughout all the comings and goings of this material world. So the bottom line is that it is not possible to understand the Supreme, to give up material attachment and renunciation simply on the basis of restricting the senses because the hankering for sense enjoyment is not replaced. It just comes back as soon as one is restored to some semblance of a healthy condition. And similarly, there are all sorts of processes by which there are restrictions for managing the senses. Astanga yoga, yama, niyama, asana, pramayama, pratyahara, dhyana, dhyana. There are many, many processes, all of which are recommended for persons who have a poor fund of knowledge. For persons who know not about the spiritual world, but they just want to reduce the suffering, reduce the symptoms of disease in this material world. However, one who has tasted even once, even passingly, the beauty of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the course of their advancement in Krishna consciousness no longer has a taste for dead material things. It is as if in connection with the spiritual master, a fire has been lit inside of that devotee. Fire is latent within wood, but it will remain there until such time as someone comes with fire externally. It's only when you bring fire externally in the form of a match and you touch it to the wood that the fire in the wood comes out. So we all are originally Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhu Karanai Shravanadi Sudha Chitikariya. By nature, constitutionally, we are hooked up with Krishna, our eternal Lord and well wishing friend. 
However, that realization, that passion, that fire remains locked and repressed and unrealized within us until we come into contact with a bona fide spiritual master. And by the words flowing from his mouth, the fire is ignited. The words from the mouth, because he or she has seen the truth, their words have the unique effect of igniting and illuminating the fire from within us. And the devotee who's on fire, who's in the fire, so to speak, never has any trouble controlling the senses. There's no need for any restrictions or for any repressions. The fire, the hankering, the overwhelming urge to see the Lord and to serve the Lord's lotus feet immediately burns to ashes all the results of sinful activities. Kapil Dave tells his mother that devotees easily achieve that position of sense control, which is achieved only with great difficulty by the yogis, the mental speculators, the impersonalists, and the Ganges. And even after they achieve it, they can't maintain it. They can't hold on to it. <clears throat> Kapil says, Yat pada pankaja pelasha pelasha bhaktam karmasyam gratita gratihanti shanto, that hard knotted attachment to material sense gratification is very easily loosed, cut by the activities of devotional service. The devotees, the swans, enjoy taking from the lotus buds. There's a very a gourmet type of a food which is to be had from the buds of lotus flowers. The swans will go in with their beaks to the buds of the lotus flower and take this extremely soft, relishable type of foodstuffs. So those devotees who are searching after the nuggets in the lotus buds of the Lord's name, fame, form, and activities the hard knotted attachment for material sense gratification is cut to pieces. It's shredded. It's totally destroyed. Never to reappear again in the heart of the devotee. Tadavam narikta matiyoya shrotigarams tadam aranam basudevam. The waves, the incessant waves of desire, which flow like rivers to the ocean, are stopped. They're checked. And they're even reversed by the execution of devotional service. Devotees go deep, deep into the lotus buds of the Lord's pastimes. And the depth and the breadth and the oceanic quantity of those pastimes is such that not only is the flow of desires like rivers to the ocean checked, but as the tide of the ocean rises, as the fire of one's Krishna consciousness blazes up and intensifies, it not only checks the incessant flow of desires, but it rolls them back. It rolls them back so that our senses no longer are our enemies. There's no longer any need to repress our senses, but rather the senses are our best friend. And as far as our past history of sinful reactions as far as our karma is concerned it's described that there are three kinds of transcendentalists who are trying to control their senses and overcome the influence of the material modes of nature the the jnanis the mental speculators the yogis and the bhaktas and the goal of all of them is the same to overcome the influence of the senses which are compared to the incessant waves of the river but only the bhaktas by virtue of connecting in devotion with the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, only the bhaktas become so overwhelmed with ananda, with transcendental bliss, that automatically their desires for material enjoyment stop. On the other hand, the yogis and jnanis who haven't got any attachment for the Lord, they simply struggle against the waves of desire. The best they can do is achieve a sort of a detached state where they hover above sense gratification, but they haven't 
they haven't achieved the shelter of the Lord's lotus feet. They don't see the Lord's lotus feet. And failing to take that higher shelter, they again come back down to this material world. Yane Ravindaksha Aravindamana. Ravindaksha means the lotus eyed Lord. Those who do not see the lotus eyed Lord, and this is specifically referring to the yogis and the mental speculators, and why, how is it they can't see the lotus eyed, the lotus feet of the Lord? The lotus is in daytime, it's very obvious, you can't miss it. It's one of the most beautiful aspects of God's creation. Nobody walks past a lotus during the daytime and misses it. You were walking with your friend and he said, did you see that lotus back there? No, I didn't even notice it. That conversation never took place in the history of the world. So under what conditions does one not see the lotus flower? Think about it. The only time that you would not notice the lotus flower is at night. Similarly, those mental speculators and those yogis who are in the darkness about Supreme Personality of Godhead, they are aravindaksha. They are unaware of the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, which are shining like the sun in the sky. <clears throat> and they, by gent of their penances and austerities and perusal and scrutiny of the scriptures, can, for a period of time, distance themselves from the average people who are running around trying to indulge their senses, they can raise themselves to what's called the Brahma Jyoti, or to merge, so to speak, in the impersonal effulgence of the Lord. The problem is not having got that Padam Drishpa, not being informed about the vastness and the variety and the superiority of Padam, the spiritual nature, the, the pull, the, the gravitational pull of material engagements brings them eventually back down to this material platform. And so they're going up and down and up and down and up and down, never to resolve the issue of attachment to the senses. And we found that devotional service, even a little bit of devotional service, even um, kind of like left-wing uh, devotional service is, is more than adequate to bring that same Brahma Jyoti, that same devotion, that same realization, that same category of liberation, of merging even to the enemies of the Lord. Those yogis and speculators who undergo great austerities for many, many lifetimes, and they achieve a higher platform. They merge within the Brahma Jyoti of the Lord. There are so many instances where even the enemies of the Lord the enemies of the Lord got that same type of liberation. Not necessarily have a form in the planet and features as the Lord, but that liberation, which is endeavored for a lifetime after lifetime by yogis and jnanas, is achieved by being killed by the Lord, by such demons as Agasura and Putana. Agasura, it says, someone may argue, well, why would Agasura have gotten... Uh, uh, liberation. Why would he have been brought into and merged with the body of the Lord? And the answer is that he just thought of Krishna for a moment. He thought of Krishna in enmity. He wanted to kill Krishna. But the problem is that no one can think of Krishna unless they're Krishna consciousness. No one can think of Krishna unless they're Krishna consciousness. No one can think of Krishna without devotion. So the fact that Agasura, even though he was trying to kill Krishna, thought of Krishna there had to have been an element of devotion in there. And he got, just by virtue of, of, of being killed by Krishna, he got the same type of liberation that the impersonalists and the speculators did. Now think of Putana. Putana had killed many children by smearing poison on her breasts. She had done it. We don't even know how many countless times before she was sent by Kamsa into Vrindavan to do the same to Krishna. She transformed her ugly demoniac body into a beautiful woman. She'd smeared an extremely powerful poison on her breasts and offered their breast milk to Krishna. And Krishna took her breast and began sucking. He sucked 
the milk, he sucked the poison, and eventually ended up sucking the life air out of Poitou. <clears throat> I remember Radha Karma, who does Katakali dancing in Los Angeles, came to one of our festival of India's up here, and she prevented, she presented the dance Putana Moksha. I found it was fascinating the way she depicted it. Because you could tell that although she was ordered by Kamsa to kill Krishna, and she knew that if she failed to kill Krishna, then Kamsa would kill her. So she had that burden on her, that she was deputed by her master Kamsa to kill Krishna. And so, you know, having undertaken the task, she wanted to complete it. At the same time, once she saw Krishna, she, she became full of devotion. So she, she, had, she, she, had the, she was conflicted. She instantly saw Krishna, the beauty of Krishna, and she's never the same again. She wasn't, she wasn't that blood-thirsty, child-killing witch anymore. She had a, a vast history of it. She had a habit of it. Who knows how many times she'd done it. She obviously had a taste for killing small children. But all of that evaporated as soon as she set her eyes on the beauty of Krishna. And she was no longer the same demoniac, person that she'd been. She was completely purified. She had awakened within her heart devotion to Krishna. And so in the middle of all of that, she's supposed to kill him. So I'll never forget Radha Karma. I, don't, I couldn't do it, but she's like, she's like, when she looks at Krishna, she could just see she's swimming in love. Her eyes are feasting on the beauty of Krishna. And her heart is hankering after Krishna consciousness. But then she th then, she, then you can see her head snap up and she's thinking, and she's looking back towards Mathura and she's thinking, well, this is, Kamsa told me I have to kill Krishna or he'll kill. And so she goes back then with renewed determination to have Krishna suck the poison from her breast. But then again, as soon as she looks at Krishna, she just immediately, you can see the motherly feeling. She doesn't want to kill Krishna. She wants to protect him. And so when Krishna takes things in his own hands and sucks the poison, without being negatively affected, sucks the milk, sucks the life air. Basically, Krishna's doing what Putana in her heart of hearts wanted to be done. She wanted Krishna to be saved. She did not want to execute the mission of Kamsa. And on some level, she wanted to give up her demoniac body. And she was actually, had become qualified by Krishna putting his mouth on her nipple and sucking her breast. By that touch of Krishna's lotus mouth, she actually became instantly qualified to give up that sinful body. She was absolved of all the reactions of sinful activities. Imagine how much sin there was, having killed many, many babies by poisoning them, and yet all of that. Nah, it says, I am Ikriti Nivasho Janmakotya, Yadbiyada, Nama Shrasyana Mahat. In the case of Ajamil, the Vishnu Dutas told the Yama Dutas, I am Ikriti Nirvisho, Janma Koti, Janma Koti Just by once having chanted the name of Krishna, the sins from Janma Koti, thousands and thousands of previous births, have immediately been eradicated. Damnam Shwasti Ayanam Namaha, simply by virtue of chanting the holy names of the Lord one time. So big demons like Agasura and Putana. Just because they saw Krishna and they and their fire of devotion was rekindled in the process of seeing Krishna. They had come with the vilest of intentions, deputed by the evil minded Kamsa to kill Krishna, but they ended up becoming 100% Krishna consciousness, became purified of all their sinful activities, and were gathered into the Brahma Jyoti effulgence of the Lord. Such a such an astounding result, such an astounding promotion, just on the basis of a slight measure, a slight drop of Krishna consciousness. Even a tiny bit of advancement in Krishna consciousness saves one from the greatest danger. Um, the one who has come to the point of seeing those lotus eyes and the transcendental form of Shaima Sundar never again has to worry about relapsing into the ways, names, and forms, entanglements of this material world. 
But those who do not see, who live in the darkness, ignorance of the shining lotus feet of Krishna, which are up there like the sun in the sky. Now, who can't see the sun? The sun is available for everyone. It's shedding its rays for everyone's well-being. But those who turn their backs on the sun, they can't see the sun. The sun is there. The sun is obvious. Nothing more precautious, nothing more obvious than the sun. But when you turn your back, being misled by those who are envious of the Lord, then you become cast into shadow. And for those, rules and regulations are required. Just like for a sick man, he has to give off eating the food that he likes in the interests of becoming restored to health. But those who are situated in service of the spiritual master at the lotus feet of the Lord needn't worry about any sort of restrictions. They needn't worry about repressing the senses. They have only one duty, and that is to fan the flame of ecstatic love and attachment to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that flame of hankering, that flame of desire, just as, as, just as a blazing fire burns firewood to ashes, so does the fire of devotional service performed under the expert guidance of the spiritual master burn to ashes all the reactions to sinful activities. <clears throat> this fire not only burns up all the reactions to impious activities, but even the reactions to pious activities turns them also to ashes. There are three stages of reactions it's described. There are reactions already achieved, there are reactions in the making, and there are reactions just beginning to fructify. So all three categories of karmic reactions are reduced to ashes for one who's acting in the constitutional position as a servant of Krishna. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhu Kavanai Shravanada Chuti. We are all eternally and constitutionally part of the superior nature, servants of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and that ecstatic, eternal, liberated nature is immediately awakened by the practice of chanting and hearing the holy names of the Lord in the same way that all darkness, all fear, all apprehensions, all anxiety, which accrue to one in the middle of the night, all that is banished with the pre-dawn rays of the rising sun. So let us all take shelter in the holy name, take shelter in other devotees, take shelter in the service of the spiritual master, apply ourselves diligently to the process of bhakti and solve all the problems of life. Om Tat Sat Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Comments, Rob? <coughs> So I've always got a question. Uh, thank you, Natasha. She'll send me the access to the TikTok this morning by email. I look forward to that. Thanks for listening, Sundari Priya. Govinda Dave says, In the New Testament, perfect love casts out fear. Yes, indeed. Bhai Bhavi, with one of her questions, why do the impersonals go to the temple and worship the deity? Because, because we'd get no satisfaction from an impersonal concept of God. There's no relationship, reciprocity there. We can't taste rasa. The impersonalists are not going towards anything. They're going away from material sense gratification. They recognize that it's productive of misery, and that's to their credit. But unless you replace material sense gratification with spiritual engagement and devotional service, the hankering for material sense gratification will always be there. So the impersonalists go and they worship the form of the Lord in the temple because on some level they realize, I need a relationship. I cannot sustain myself. I cannot continue to be excited about my future without at least some semblance of a relationship. And they justify it to themselves by saying, well, it's just temporary, and eventually the form of the deity and my form will um, uh, dissipate and will merge and become one. But for now, 
they are feeding their they're in a in a in a kind of roundabout indirect way it's called shadow attachment they're actually feeding their devotional creeper in a roundabout way rationalizing it that it's only temporary the devotees do not worship the deities at all in the same mood as the impersonals for the devotees the deity is eternal we're eternal devotional service is eternal we don't worship the deity as a temporary expedient to get somewhere beyond the deity we worship the deity right now in the conditional state we become expert our love matures our fire of hankering burns more and more brightly the more and more we worship the deity and then when we pass over from the conditioned world from the material world to the spiritual world, we continue to worship the deity the only difference is the quality of worship the quality of devotion the quality of engagement is become much much more pure just like the more you burn a base metal the more you burn it and more you more, more you burn it the more a pure metal emerges from uh, inside of that <clears throat> so thank you Vaibhavi thank you Bhakti Gary Dibya Ram Kishore Hari Bol Natasha Sundari Priya Brent Thank you all for joining us on Facebook. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your likes. Thank you for your thumbs up. Are you there, Rob? You want to say something? Send us off. Yes, Prabhuji. Um, I'm just grateful that I've had this opportunity to, to come into this existence as a human to where I have a, the opportunity to, to refine my devotional service. And uh, I need to remember not to waste this opportunity. Nice thought, nice thought. Let's all pray for the fire, because once that fire kindles and starts burning, ain't nothing going to stop us from going back to home, back to Godhead. Ado shodo tado sang tado nartan avita shash tata shaktish tata shadas sadakanam hariyo bhai hariyo bhai bhai. Beginning with a little faith, and one wants to associate with devotees, and in the association of devotees, one's bad habits go away gradually one develops attachment and then from attachment is taste but when you get to that point of taste then it's only a matter of time then from from crawling and walking you begin to run from from skateboarding now you're on the the jumbo jet back to home back to god so let's all uh, make sure we keep moving steadily forward through the various preliminary stages of faith association with devotees giving up our bad habits to that point where we can't live that krishna consciousness the chanting of the holy names of the lord association of devotees and devotional service are like the air of life to us like water to a fish that's my hope for myself that's my hope for all of you on this Wisdom Wednesday morning. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Rama.